Caleb, what is the most common turkey hunting violation? This week on Kentucky Afield, we went live on social media to answer all of your spring turkey hunting questions, and we're bringing you those answers right now. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Have you ever tried Chick-fil-A sauce on, a, on turkey tender? <laughs> Kentucky Afield, every week Kentucky Afield brings you on hunting and fishing across the state. What a nice fish. <laughs> I'll need to hopefully get that bird in the way. Hey, we got another one over here. There he is. Ooh, a nice one too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Got the first help. Barely made it out of the field. Got one. Big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. Look at that joker. Woo. <laughs> That's a good one. There. Look at that. Oh, Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles, and tonight you have tuned in for our annual spring turkey question and answer show. Joining me as usual, I have a panel of guests to answer all of your questions. First up, I have a face you've seen quite a bit before, Zach Danks. Zach, you're the turkey program coordinator, and you've been doing that now for quite a few years, haven't you? Yeah, eighth year. Eighth year. So he can talk about some of the trends we've had. Also, what we're looking forward to this year as far as our turkey population. Yep. Next up, I have Jacob Stewart. And Jacob, you are a private lands biologist. I know you uh, official title is private lands biologist or private lands program coordinator. So if a person out there that has a piece of property that wants to attract more wildlife, and tonight we're gonna to mainly talk about turkeys, yeah. you can help us out with that, can't you? Yeah, Chad, we have a program, we have biologists out across the state uh, set up to help you reach your management goals. This ain't our management goals, it's your management goals, whether that be turkey, deer, uh, butterflies, birds, whatever you're looking for, we are there to help you uh, along your way. All right, fantastic. I know a lot of people want to know, how can I attract more turkeys to my property? So tonight's the night you get the answer for that. And then joining us on the end, we have Travis uh, Abrams. Travis, you're a conservation officer out of the 3rd District. Yes, sir. Glad to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be 3rd here. 3rd District's a great area to hunt turkeys. There's a lot of areas in the 3rd District that, uh, that get a lot of turkey pressure. There's also some uh, WMAs within the 3rd District that are pretty popular for turkey hunting. So yes, sir. Yeah. Very glad to have you. All right, um, this year, let's, let's first start off with our season dates because really that's the most important. So this year, um, our youth turkey season starts on April the 6th and 7th. That's the youth weekend. Tra tell, me, uh, tell me there, Travis, to qualify to hunt the youth season, what do you have to do to qualify to hunt the youth season? Well, you have to be under the age of 15 years old. 12 to 15 is a youth. You'd be required to have a youth hunting license as well as a youth turkey permit. Anyone under the age of 12 is licensed and permit exempt. Okay, now you still have to tell check those birds regardless. Yes sir, you still have to tell check the birds, same same exact way. Um, Hunter Ed is required for those that meet the requirements. Okay, yep. so uh, hopefully you've got your Hunter Ed certification taken care of. If not, you know, you can go on there and do that online uh, with the exception of the range portion. Do we still have the option now, if, you, if you've if you never used the one-year exemption, do you have a one-year exemption available for people who have not taken? Yes, sir. Yep. It's still around. You, you got it for a year. After that year, though, you, you'd have to go get one. Okay. Yep. All right. And then the, uh, the regular turkey season this year, the general turkey season, this year opens up on April the 13th. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about April 13th and how you personally picked that date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's not, not me personally. And in any given year, it varies because the the youth season is the first full weekend in April. So this year, you didn't get a Saturday and Sunday until the 6th and the 7th. Okay. Last year, it was the 1st and 2nd. Yeah. The general season is the Saturday closest to the 15th, which this year happens to be the 13th. So, so it ranges from April 12th to April 18th. So when the date shifts, it's based on the calendar, Saturday close to April 15th. So this year we kind of mo we moved our seasons closer together because they're literally the back-to-back -back weekends. Mm -hmm. Our general season came early, a little bit earlier, and our youth season went a little later. So uh, mm -hmm. that is 100% set by the calendar, and it's been that way for how many years now? Um, 
I think since 2006 Okay, uh, was the last change we made to dates. So a lot of times we hear people say, man, I wish the season was earlier, or, or sometimes traditional bow hunters want more foliage out, and they want it to be later. The simple fact is the, the dates are set by reg and regulation, and they are based on the calendar, how the calendar falls. That's right, yep. It, and for a period of years in the early 2000s, sometimes we'd open on a Wednesday or a Monday, sometimes we'd April, April 15th exactly, so it would vary the day of the week that it opened. But yeah. people like the weekend opener, uh, we've got a 23-day season, four weekends, so it's a lot of opportunity for folks. Yeah, and you said it, 23-day season, so we, we're going to be going from April the 13th all the way out till May 5th. Mm -hmm. So um, that uh, it's a good amount of time to get out, regardless of your work schedule or your kids' activities. It's a good mm -hmm. amount of time to get out and pursue turkey hunting this year. It is. Yeah. All right, we have been getting questions. Uh, we, we did a little thing online where we were offering hats to the first three questions that we ask. I have three questions here that have been picked. So if you are one of the first three questions we, we asked today, you will be receiving one of these Kentucky Field camouflaged hats. So first up, let's see. We have Gregory Gukeisen, and uh, his question is, what is the overall condition of the turkey population here in Kentucky? Pretty broad question, but it's a question that everyone wants to know the answer to. It is, yep. Yeah, new hunters, veteran hunters, Everybody wants to know what turkey numbers are like. Overall, you know, simplest answer I can give is that we have a healthy population in this state. Um, we people come from many states to hunt turkeys here, and um, you know we've got lots of opportunity. Uh, a lot of public land to pursue birds. Private lands uh, is the majority of our state, but numbers are down somewhat from what they were maybe 10, 12 years ago when we kind of hit high in our population, but populations come down some, but it's still very strong. Uh, other states have seen population declines a little more severe than we have. We're very stable, generally speaking. Uh, we do fluctuate some, mm -hmm. but still a very good chance, very good flock in our state. A lot of times when people ask about what the turkey populations are, they're obviously concerned about the overall number of birds, but when you're a hunter, you really want to know about two-year-old male birds, right? Yeah. Two-year and older male birds. Right. Mm -hmm. What's that population looking like? It's, it's pretty good. So um, last year, 2023, we was our second highest harvest ever. Mm -hmm. And that was directly a product of the really good hatch we had in 2021. Okay. Because birds that survived, uh, poults that survived 2021, a lot of them were males, grew up to be two-year-olds last year, and we had a, had a great season. Uh, the hatch was, hasn't been quite as good the last two springs, but it's been good, stable. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of jakes out there right now. Okay. So, I mean, anybody, if you want to take a jake, but there's a lot of jakes. So, uh, it's two-year-old bird numbers are still good, but we've got, uh, next year is probably even brighter, I would expect. But okay. Still good this year, though. All right. Next question is from Jameson Netherly. He wants to know, what is the best way to increase turkey habitat and population on private lands? He wants to know a little bit about trapping and wants to know uh, if there's any ways to help keep and maintain a healthy flock of birds. So what, what would you say if you're going to say two things that you need to do on a 100-acre track of property, what were the two things you'd recommend right off the bat? So right off the bat, uh, if you noticed what Zach said, the importance of the hatch, uh, leading to the number of birds two years later that we're able to harvest. Yeah. Uh, so the most important thing we can do for turkey populations in the state is to provide the habitat for nesting and brooding and getting those broods up to be the age that we can harvest them. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 to 70 percent in some studies of a poults are die so at the end of the day it is really important to increase the number of uh poults and make it to your jakes and then your two-year-old birds later you can harvest so the way you do that is you provide nesting cover so some thick type shrubby cover with uh, some some uh, native grasses that kind of stuff in close proximity to what we call brooding cover. Uh, grasses and forbs are wildflower mix that uh, produce uh, insects because those first uh, two to four weeks, uh, or first week to four weeks, those uh, insects are very important for the poults. And then really survival of a poult after four weeks 
it's pretty well exponential on going up on survival. So that first four weeks is, you know, crucial. So providing some nesting cover and brooding cover are the two main things that I would say, if you're gonna do two things to help your turkey population, that's the key to it right there. Okay. And then they wanna know a little bit about, uh, about uh, predators. Um, tell me some of the big predators for turkey nest, and then if you, uh, if you would put a plan together to address that, or if there's good habitat, they got a way to hide, so that's gonna help a lot. But uh, as far as nest raiders, what, what do you, what predators are the worst for turkeys? So, Zach, jump in here if I'm, uh, if I miss any, but your, your raccoons, uh, your skunks, your possums, uh, snakes, uh, as far as your nest predators go, uh, is, is a big thing. And, you know, the whole idea behind trapping, trapping is, is, a, is just another management tool uh, to help you get down the road. Uh, habitat and trapping are two things that you need to have together to really be successful. Uh, really, just doing one or the other is not the end, uh, end game. There's no magic uh, bullet to that. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, uh, it's a whole lot easier not to mow than to put all the effort into trapping. And that I'm not mowing will equal better habitat and protection from those predators. Yeah. It's amazing, it doesn't matter what, uh, what species we're talking about. It could be in the fall, we're talking about deer. It could be small game habitat. It really always comes down to, if you have the piece of property, sometimes it's less work, less mowing, less spraying, allowing certain areas to get, get thick, to raise young, always tends to be a good way to go. And certain times of year, mowing can be extremely detrimental because the young is, are there and it can be really, really, really bad. So well, I think that's the key, you know, what Jake was saying, no, don't mow, he's talking about during the nesting season, mm -hmm. which here is, April, you know, is yeah. when our first nest happened, um, all through May, and then of course you got uh, hatching. So we'll have poults on the ground in May, June, especially, mm -hmm. even into July for re-nest. Uh, so really, if you could stay off the bush hog between April and August, it would be, you're up in your odds. And then you can do mowing for maintenance or management, mm -hmm. you know, along with other better practices that, that we biologists would like to see, like. Uh, prescribed fire or strip disking or real targeted specific herbicide applications, but avoiding that nesting season is really your best bet. But keeping things moving, you want a diversity of cover types managed different ways on, on any property to maximize use by turkey. You could have zero predators and you run over two or three turkey nests with a tractor, uh, oh, it yeah. doesn't matter. You not increased, you can eliminate the landscape of predators. If you mow over the eggs, it, you're gonna have zero poults. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some recent yeah. research in Tennessee showed a good proportion of their nest loss was from mowing. So if you did implement a trapping program on your place, which is great, do it. But if you could expect to influence the number of predators or, or increase turkey productivity, 10%. That would be phenomenal. Like you don't even see that in research where they do real intensive predator management. But just for mowing alone, they mowed up like, I forget, 13 or 12, 13% of the nest just in mowing. Yeah. So that alone, if we could do that across the state, do a better job at staying off it. You know, we're not, you know, unfortunately prime haymaking time in this state is right during nesting season. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to make a living growing hay, that's one thing. But if there's fields you don't have to, to mow or, or mow early, then that's a good way to up your population. Just stay off the bush hogs. So if you're while, trying to trap and you're market. creating shooting lanes and you mow in shooting lanes Do to shoot the coyotes, then you, you're, you, your net net loss is bad. I mean, even if you kill some coyotes, you're probably net net. If you've mowed strips, then you probably are net down just because you may have destroyed a couple turkey nests. And yeah. That can be a huge, uh, a huge loss. Yeah. Next question uh, is from Don Ellis. What are the guidelines for turkey hunting on WMAs and where are these posted for everyday viewing? So what are the rules and regulations as it pertains to turkey hunting on WMAs? And uh, are, do we have quota hunts for turkey hunting, turkey on w, WMAs? Or are they pretty much all open to normal statewide regs? It depends on the WMA. Um, a lot of them have their own regulations that a hunter would have to follow. Um, like I said, it varies. So you can find that information on our website under the public lands, public hunting tab. Uh, search whichever particular WMA you're interested in hunting at, 
and it can give you all the regs that you need to find out before you get out there and get after it. You know, <clears throat> we made the comment, uh, look at the rules and regulations by checking out the guides. This year, different than in past years, our turkey hunting guides are actually not printed on paper. Uh, as what we're seeing is everyone's going to one of these um, and it's much easier to access an entire turkey guide. So the best way to do it this year is to actually go online and there's a QR code and we'll show you this QR code here in a second. You can actually go on and hit that, hit that QR code and get the turkey guide on there and search through it. It's probably the best and easiest way. So if you're waiting for that turkey guide to hit your local retail store, it's already available. It's just available online. So make sure you go on there, click on it, and, and read your rules and regulations and make sure that nothing has changed in the area that you're hunting and uh, refresh yourself on all of our rules and regulations as it pertains to turkey hunting. So uh, I always grab a guide. I always throw it in my truck or in my boat. And I've noticed that I always go to my phone to get my answer because it's just, yep. it seems like it's yeah. easier. Yeah. And now with the, on the fishing side, you got the boat fishing uh, app. That seems to have all the information you need too. So um, if you, uh, if that's something that uh, you'd like to have a printed copy, you can always go online and print it off of there as well. But I'll tell you, if you get used to using your phone, it's pretty handy. So next question we have from Colby. What are your top tips for public land turkey hunting? We talked a little bit about it. What, what tips would you give a person that's uh, gonna public land hunt this year? Start online with our interactive map, mm -hmm. uh, our website, go to where to hunt and you'll find a map of the state. You can zoom in, um, you'll see the boundaries. Spend some time looking on there. At least one of our WMAs has additional maps of, on where habitat practices are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's maybe others. And then, you know, you got your favorite app, Onyx, or whatever program you use. Uh, but, but be sure and look at our website because it's going to have up-to-date boundaries on it because sometimes we acquire new properties. and Just want to make sure you've got your maps laid out right. Uh, I think our younger generation of hunters are pretty savvy with using technology, but anybody can get online and, and, uh, and, and scroll around and look for ridges, look for saddles if you're in the mountains, look for, you know, where fields and woods meet, you know, think about entry points and exit, exit points that you could use, but that everybody else might use and mm -hmm. places you might want to avoid. So. Tell me, um, are you going to be hunting public or private land hunting this year or a little bit of both? Both, I hope. Both? Okay. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jacob? I'll do both. Uh, okay. Predominantly, I actually, I enjoy hunting the public land. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a runner and gunner, uh, which means I like to mess up my own turkey hunt most <laughs> of the time. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, the idea of public land hunting, uh, you know, I've had a lot of good, uh, before I took this job, a random management area, uh, which gave me the opportunity to get out early and hunt. And I've had a lot of really good hunts. People think you need to go early. Uh, later in the season, when all them hens get on the nest, uh, I've heard a whole lot of goblin and had some really good hunts late. Uh, and the WMAs really decreased the number of the pressure of people coming uh, out later in the uh, later in the season. So yeah. don't think it's a, it's a loss uh, if you don't get out there the first two weeks. Okay, uh, for sure. Off Sabre, are you going to hunt this year? Oh yeah, hunt? you oh, bet. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to hunt? Are you going to hunt public or private lands? I hunt wherever I can, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I got I got a private land spot. Okay, I like to go to. Yes, sir. Tell me, tell me how you would approach, or maybe it's no change. If you the, think about the, the public land you plan on hunting this year and the private land you're, you're going to hunt, do you alter how you hunt for public versus private land any at all? Um, think about this year. Do you, do, you, do you approach that a little different, be it the use of decoys, be it how much you move? Um, where you set up, do you take a different approach if it's public versus private lands? Probably some, yeah. Because I, I think I do a little bit as well. Less decoys, yeah. less calling. Um, I'll go later in the year on public. Yeah. Uh, was, we've had luck together doing that. Yeah. Um, and this year I'm looking forward to hunting eastern Kentucky, hunting, okay. hunting the mountains, which I've really done very little of. So. It'll be different there just because my private land is, is not there. So be just by virtue of different geography, but, but yeah, it, it's bigger properties than the private lands I hunt. So I can uh, run and gun more if need to. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be a little different for me. What about you? Do you think you take a different approach uh, um, public land versus private land? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you're, 
your private land, you know, most people probably have an average between 50 and 100 acres. Uh, and it can get pretty frustrating hearing that bird gobbling on the other side of the fence uh, and, and, and uh, you know, wishing it was here, which on your public land, you have a little more of the ability to work multiple birds, you know, take your time spending in the woods, just trying to trying to find them. Uh, you know, and the, and the thing, I think the, the key to all turkey hunting is the idea of knowing your landscape that you're hunting to know how that bird may or may not react, where they may be gobbling. Uh, I've had a lot of times on private land, you'll sit there and hunt and there'll be a bird gobbling and strutting. Uh, and then there's a woven wire fence that they will not come through no matter how hard you call or what you do, uh, it just deters them. So knowing yeah. that kind of stuff really helps you, uh, you know, pick where you're gonna sit up and how you hunt. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good point. If there's a barrier there, I mean, and even things that we not even, won't even think of as barriers, Turkeys are finicky, aren't they? There's yeah. certain things that will hold a bird up, and you're like, what in the world? That bird once mm -hmm. come here, it's gobbling like crazy. How come I can't get this bird to finish? It could be the silliest thing. Like I say, it could be some, uh, a fence that you didn't even know was there and can't yeah. see it until you walk down there, and you're like, huh, Yeah. I was trying to call this bird through here, and it just won't make it. I've even seen them hold it up on creeks and just strut back and forth, and you're like, you can fly. You yeah. can come right across there if you want. You know, It's just a jump for a bird and two wing flaps, yeah. but... For whatever reason, they just, they, they're, they're finicky like that. Yeah. Uh, next uh, question is from Cruz. Wants to know if you can purchase additional turkey tags. No, not, uh, I guess, uh, youth. If you don't have the youth sportsman and you just have the youth turkey permit, then you could purchase a second one. It's my understanding to get your second bird. Correct, yeah, for, for the youth. Okay. But uh, everybody else, you just have the only option would be to get a bonus bird on one of the, the federal properties, Fort Knox, Fort Campbell, um, or one of the auctions we have for a commissioner's tags. Yeah. Otherwise, your, your statewide license covers the two tags that you get. Okay. And uh, we always get this question. Uh, we, we do allow two birds uh, in Kentucky, but they have to be taken on different days. They can't be taken at the same time because we get that question a lot. How come other states, I guess, do allow multiple birds to be taken in one day, mm -hmm. but uh, not here in Kentucky? It has to be two separate days, right? Yep. There's a, there's a number of states that allow you to take both, but most states are one per day. Yeah. It's just a way to spread the pressure out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next question, can you hunt with a bow or crossbow instead of a firearm? Tell me about, uh, and, how, and how often, first off, what's your answer? Can you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's totally legal to use a, a bow or a crossbow. Um, either bow or crossbow, there's no minimum draw weight. You got to be careful with the uh, your broadheads, though. It can't be a barbed broadhead, and it has to be no greater than seven-eighths of an inch. Okay. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, and you said no greater or no less than seven-eighths of an inch on the, no. on the broadhead. No less. No less. Yeah, I think you said that no time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah, it has to be. It has to be at least seven eighths of an inch. Yes, right. sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, how many people do you see out using uh, using a? There's there's not many. Yeah. Not many people using a string. Um, it's tough. So you know, whenever I see it, I kind of tip my hat to it. Yeah. But for most parts, people using shotguns. Yeah. Um, next question. We're getting uh, questions about turkey banding. Turkey banding. We actually did a show. We went out with you guys, and I think mm -hmm. we were in Woodford County, if I ain't mistaken. Yep. And um, turkey banding involves turkey baiting. Yep. And I've learned really fast why baiting turkeys is illegal. Because, man, when you get the birds to start coming, you get them all, don't you? You get a lot, yeah. <laughs> you can. We uh, went out there and set up a trap and, uh, and, and uh, put some bait out. And it took a few hours, but when they came in, we mm -hmm. were able to uh, take quite a few turkeys and put bands on them and release them back out. Tell me a little bit about banding and what's going on in the world of banding turkeys and what we're yeah. learning. Yeah, so the banding project is, is designed to help us understand harvest pressure on our population. We do this with all kinds of wildlife. Um, turkeys are difficult because they're, they're hard, to, hard to get uh, that many birds hitting a spot consistently have them there the day that you're out there and, and catch them. You know, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. So that show right there, you know, we were just there one day, but Joe Lacefield and some helpers, landowners had been baiting the site for a while, you know, because sometimes it takes birds a while to find it. But uh, yeah, by putting bands on, on those male birds, 
when they're then subject to harvest, we can look at the percentage of them that get harvested. And that, that helps us estimate what the harvest pressure is like in the greater population, because we're doing this research all across the state. And uh, that's really, in my mind, it's been the first step in research to help us understand, well, are our regulations where they need to be? Mm -hmm. let's, do some, let's do some research and find out. And, you know, because there's a lot of factors that influence turkey populations, but the, the one thing we as a department can control are regulations. And in order to understand that, let's go take some measurements. In this case, the measurements are the bands and the number of them that get harvested. What, uh, what type of uh, uh, percentage of hunters that take a banded bird do, you, do we think reach back out to us? And are there any incentives for them to do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so everybody that reports to us gets a certificate telling them information about where their bird was banded and how much it weighed. Kind of a nice keepsake you can put on your wall if you'd like to. Uh, there are a percentage of them that are, that are reward bands as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so far uh, we think that our estimates of harvest rates or recovery rates on those bands are about 20 to 30 percent. Uh, the research is still ongoing, so we won't know for another couple of years. Uh, this, this year that's pretty much just wrapped, we've just wrapped up our turkey trapping, our third season. Next year, we'll, our fourth season will be the, the final year of the project. And we'll put all that data together. Our research partners at Tennessee Tech University mm -hmm. will, will crunch the numbers for us and do some fancy statistical modeling and help us to understand uh, where we are. And the state of Tennessee is doing the same thing. So uh, yeah, once that's completed, then we'll have a better sense of, of where things are, actual some hard and fast numbers to go with you know, the, the other data sources like our telecheck information and our brood surveys and reports from officers and biologists in the field. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question is coming from Ethan Blair. Uh, with the national decrease in turkey population, where does Kentucky stand in that? And first off, is there a national or is it regional? What is going on with the, the national turkey population right now? And then break it down kind of close to us here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's pretty much consensus that per turkey populations across the eastern U.S. Are, have come down some from highs seen five to 15 years ago, depending on where you are exactly. Mm -hmm. The southeast seems to have the, the most severe declines. The Midwest is, has seen some declines, several states. Northeast is not, not declining to the same degree. Uh, we have, have seen some, some numbers in some of the mid-Atlantic states, but uh, by and large, they're, you know, concerned hunters all over the country. The sky is not falling totally. Um, turkey populations are dynamic, just like all wildlife populations are. Mm -hmm. But a lot of Kentucky hunters and hunters from other states are saying, you know, I'm just not seeing the birds that I saw 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. What's going on? There's got to be something going on. Well, there's multiple things going on. And... So, so there's no silver bullet fix, but you know we build more and more houses every day. We simplify our landscape, and there are a lot of predators on the landscape, but part of that's because we don't trap and we make landscapes really simple and make it pretty easy for those predators to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we concentrate animals around the feeders that we put out. That probably has implications for the predator populations and how abundant they are as well as affecting turkey movements. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that, that go on, that are going on with turkey populations and nobody's really got it figured out. Uh, but you know, we talked about habitat earlier and biologists like to talk about that, but keep in mind that we're talking about a specific deficit in, on the landscape for a real important life stage of the turkey and that's that nesting and broodering time period. So if we're mowing up nests before they have a chance, then we're forcing that hen to re-nest, which she can do, but you know, that's just rolling the dice, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I do think habitat across our state and other states is part of it, and it just feeds right into the high predator population. So there's a lot of, lot of issues. Weather really impacts the hatch. Mm -hmm. At least we think that from uh, past decades. And, that's highly variable. So when we get lots and lots of rain in April and May, that, that can be really detrimental to, 
to nesting hens and, and then of course little little poles that can't thermoregulate. Mm -hmm. so, lots of factors. So uh, we, we're seeing this national decline, but uh, from what I'm gathering, it's not like you biologists that are out surveying the landscape, you're not finding dead or deceased mature birds. The decline not, is happening at a nest or poult stage. Yeah, we're not and, making new turkeys like we should be. Gotcha. Yeah, there, there's a host of diseases, and no, I haven't mentioned that, but yeah, that can affect turkeys, and, and we have research partners and several states looking into that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say this, any hunter that sees a sick or diseased turkey, please call us. Yeah. Um, especially ones that have wart-like growths on their head and that look really abnormal. Those are ones we really need to try to mm -hmm. to try to sample and test. So, well, all turkey heads look like they have wart, wart growths on it, but this right. is a little different. We're talking different. about yes. yeah. Th these are obviously not not normal turkeys. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're they're not common, thankfully. But but if you encounter one, we would like we to want to know about it. it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next question. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a great question. Why does turkey taste so good? And what they want to know what some of our favorite ways uh, to cook wild turkey. What's your favorite way to have wild turkey? Fried, man. <laughs> yeah. Grilled it's, Kentucky. It's That's just what I like. It's it's hard to beat, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, Kentucky Kentucky Colonel flour and uh, rolled up and fried. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you uh, what. Have you, any of you guys ever tried? Uh, I hate to be advertising for a company out there, but you ever tried Chick-fil-A sauce on a, on turkey tenders? <laughs> well, it can't sure be that good. bad, that's for sure. It'll yeah. ruin you. Yeah. I'm just telling you. Fry some turkey tender strips and uh, put a little Chick-fil-A sauce yeah. on it. I'm like, wow. This is, uh, I gave it to my kids. I think they thought they'd been to get, getting something from a fast food restaurant. Yeah. They were really tasty. So, um, I, I've tried it a bunch of different ways, but it always team, tend to go back to the uh, the fried the fried strips of turkey. T tends yeah. to be my favorite way to have. Pretty it. simple and in a hurry usually. So yeah, I yeah. Just go with what I know, and it's easy. Next question is from John Bagley. How old does a youth have to be to need a youth license? We talked about this a little earlier, but refresh us on this. How old does a when do when do you need to buy a license for a youth? Once a youth turns 12 years old. Okay. And until he's 15 years old. So once he or once they hit 16, they're no longer considered a youth for licensing. So 12 to 15, anything before that, they're exempt. So uh, uh, and if you're if you buy a license, if you buy a youth license and then turn 16, how does that work? So it's good for the whole license year. Okay. Yep. So if you can buy a youth license during the time you can purchase the license, mm -hmm. that's the license you're hunting on the entire year, right? Yes, sir. Yep. So uh, an individual that uh, is. 10 years old doesn't need a license but that uh, doesn't need a license for uh, or a turkey permit they're still good for two birds throughout that season correct yes sir mm -hmm. and then once you acquire a license there is a youth license out there that's one bird right correct so if they just bought let's just say hypothetically they had a youth hunting license and a youth turkey permit that youth turkey permit is only going to cover you for one turkey either the spring or the fall i know we're talking about spring so we'll keep it on that yeah if let's just say they shot a turkey and they wanted to go kill another one um they could buy another youth permit turkey permit and go get after it yeah so if you got three different ways there for youth either you don't need a license or you're under 16 and you can have a youth permit or you can have a Youth sportsman's Youth license, sportsman. right? So you got three different ways that you can kind of get this done. So uh, depends on what works best for you. If you know if you're going to do deer hunting and you're going to do all the rest, then you might as well better go ahead and get the youth sportsman, right? Now the youth sportsman does have two turkey permits on it. Yeah. Okay. So, so there you go. Uh, next question is from Tim Fan, and he wants to know: Can a youth take their hunter safety course as young as nine years old? What's the, what, what is too young to take your hunter safety So they need course? to be at least nine years old. That's okay. what we ask. Um, so, yeah, if he's nine or, or she, then absolutely. But the main thing is you got to be able to read, right? And you got to right. be able to read. Uh, the, you got to be able to read. You got to be able to, be able to understand it, um, yeah. you know, because it is important. And the youth, these youth, they, they got to know that. It's an important thing that we're teaching. Um, and, of course, there is a range day involved yeah. with it, too. So, yeah. you know, it gets younger and nine years old. It's a little bit, a little bit tough for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next question is from David Beard. Is it possible that bag limits will change in the future? <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Uh, we don't have plans at the moment, but that's, again, back to the banding research. The reason we're doing this research is turkeys are cool, and I love to learn things about animals just because, but we're not doing this research just because. Yeah. We're doing it 
to understand the pressure we put on the population. And depending on the findings, it might suggest a regulation change would be in order. And one of the options would be a bag limit change. Mm -hmm. So it's a possibility, just not something we're entertaining this season or, or probably next season. So many factors go into bag limits. And people think that all the time that bag limit is, uh, is the easy, quick fix to turkey populations. But it really, you know, we've seen it in deer that sometimes we can uh, offer unlimited does. But the simple fact is, is that people go out and once they take their, their buck, they're kind of done. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can offer unlimited does, but one buck, and we end up with close to a 50-50 split, right? Mm -hmm. If you offered people three, four birds, some people wanted one bird and they're done anyway, right? Some people might take more. It, it's never a really good, it's hard to figure out what you're going to get in that situation. Like right now, our, our overall number of people that are purchasing a turkey tag and hunting turkeys, is it increasing or decreasing? Overall, we haven't seen a whole lot of change. Pretty much Just stable. in general, in, in the eligible sportsmen. So that, I can't tease out hunters, like if you buy a sportsman's license or a, yeah. you know, a, a, a senior, yeah. I, I can't tell if you've turkey hunted or not, but you're eligible. The sales in those, those uh, licenses have been fairly stable. And so, what percentage of the people that have a turkey license harvest a bird? Mm, Success, the harvest at least one bird is probably between 30 and 40 percent. That's okay. what our surveys are suggesting. Now, of the successful people, of the telechecked birds, 25 percent of those people kill two. Two birds. So if, they, if yeah. they're hunting and they're avid turkey hunters, it's a pretty mm -hmm. long season. They're, they're, most of them are successful in taking two. Yeah. 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 So, but if you got a piece of property and you feel like, oh, my gosh, we don't have enough turkeys, and you hear a bird and you get out there and you hunt it and you harvest a bird, but you think mm -hmm. your numbers are down, Hunt a WMA, go out there and, and enjoy the birds without taking a shot. You can always, if you own the property, you can make the rules and restrictions more more tight, right? Right. So yeah. I, it, I did that this past year. I went out and took a bird on a piece of property that I'm used to seeing quite a few birds. Had another piece of property that I could hunt. Didn't hunt that farm anymore after I took that one bird. I was like, you know what? There might be 30 more birds over there. There may not be many mature male birds. We, 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 did, we elected to hunt a different piece of property. Right. It was actually two years ago. So, hey, you can always be, you can always be, you don't have a lot of science on your side, but if you know what your eyes are seeing and you know that, hey, I know I'm, only, I'm allowed to kill two birds, but I've got me and my brother and his sons, they're all going to go kill two birds a piece, and you don't think the land can sustain it, then hunt somewhere else or go out there without taking a bird. It's obviously an option, right? Yep, it's in your hands, yep. Um, next question is, can I set up a hunting blind in the same day of a turkey hunt or are they too skittish? This is a good question. Have you ever went out and set up a turkey blind and hunted it that, that day, the day you put it up? Yes. Have you had luck doing that? Yes. I have too. Yeah. I sure have. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would I prefer to get it set out there and brush it in a couple of days early? Sure. I would, but there are times where... The, you know, you can put the greatest game plan together and know exactly right where you're going, right where they're going to be, and then they're not there. And you want to make a move. If you, if you think you need that blind, or if you got a youth or something, and you think you need to make a move, you can certainly put a blind up and kill a bird day of putting that blind up. Mm -hmm. George uh, Phipps wants to know, uh, why does Tennessee and Virginia open turkey seasons before Kentucky every single year? Well, Tennessee actually no longer opens earlier. As of last year, they've moved their, their season to coincide with ours, basically. Okay. They open exactly when we do, and they've lowered it to a two bird limit. They used to be four bird limit. We've always been two. They used to open two weeks earlier. Now they open right when we do. Yeah. So it's in response to these population declines people are talking about. So they've moved their season back to where we are. Virginia is a little bit earlier. It's not that much, that much different. Um, again, the exact date that you open a season is probably pretty arbitrary. You know, some states open it on exactly a specific date every year, so the day of the week will vary, and some will pick a weekend, a, a reg like ours, so that it will always open on a weekend. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more important that you're generally in mid-April, mm -hmm. you know, because we're trying to time our hunting in relation to, to the nesting season uh, to make sure that breeding occurs before we start 
harvesting these gobblers. So any given state is going to have a potentially a little different regulations. But Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia are all, all kind of on the same latitude, so generally our seasons, although they're a little bit earlier, they're not that much different. Well, and as you go further south, like Florida, Florida... It's open. It's yeah. open. So mm -hmm. if you go further south, those birds are... Mississippi's season's they, open. They've so. already started their breeding season, and so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's open, right? So Yeah, yeah. The sun, but, yeah. Tennessee being south of us, it makes sense that they've been, they've been but now they're moving, and as I'm sure this is a response to lower turkey populations, right? Yeah, it's just a concern to, to try to do what they can to see if, you know, if we can allow more breeding to happen, if that's going to make a difference. I don't know, but, you know, their seasons could change in the coming years. You know, this is all adaptive management that all the states are undertaking. Uh, Caleb, what is the most common turkey hunting violation? This is a good question. It is. Um, I'd say a lot of times I see where people forget to plug their shotguns. Yeah. Um, obviously, a shotgun can't hold any more than three, so mm -hmm. that includes one chambered, two in the magazine. Um, people a lot of times will go out and buy these new shotguns and forget to put the plug in it, and they'll go out there and have five in their shotgun. That, that's illegal. That's a problem. We can't have that. So. Yeah. That's, that's probably my best answer for them. Yeah, yeah. The, the the unplugged shotgun. You know, that, that goes for a lot of different game species, but obviously turkey hunting for with a shotgun, make sure that it'll only hold three. Yes, sir. Not that you could have three in it, it'll only hold three. So you gotta make sure that you try to put that fourth in there and it won't take it, right? Correct, yep. Um, ammunition. We're getting, you know, all of these variants now of these heavy loads, be it tungsten and mm -hmm. all the things that people are using now to shoot turkeys. Some of these shots have some wide range of different ammos, five, six, and sevens, and all these different combinations. What is the rule and regulation for shot size that you have to watch out for when you go out and you buy a box of shells and take them out and pattern them with your shotgun, and you realize, wait a minute, this yeah. may or may not be what I'm looking for? Because some of them are lead combinations with tungsten in there. Yeah, uh, they can be lead or uh, steel. Mm -hmm. um, there's no restriction on that. It cannot be any greater than a, a size four. Size four. Yes, sir. And that's some of these combination loads that I think are made for duck hunting will have three, Can but then they'll have tungsten load in it too. So you got to be careful when you go look at those because you're like, oh man, this is great. I get the combination of both lead and tungsten. And But you got to be careful if it's got something smaller or larger than four, which would be a smaller number. Right. Then you got to. Then that's not for turkeys, right? Yes, sir. All right. I ran into that, so I uh, thought I thought I would throw that out there. Brad, um, let's say you have a tom gobbling on, uh, on his own really well. You move close, and then you try to call to him or her, and you never hear that bird again. What's your best opin uh, opinion on why they went silent? So you hear a bird, you make your move, you start calling, you never hear him again. Where? Do, how do you think you messed up? Or do you think that bird's still there? All the above. Yeah. It's just hard to know. Sometimes yeah. you're not as concealed as you are and they're gonna see you. Sometimes they've just been called to so much, they they get nervous and you know, you'd be better off uh, not trying to get so close to them. Because mm -hmm. when they if they respond to you, they know where you are. Mm -hmm. At that point, you need to really think about, be real strategic about when you call mm -hmm. and where you call from because he's just honed in on you. Mm -hmm. if, he can, if he has responded, he knows right where you are. And it may take him two hours, four hours. Mm -hmm. Good chance he's coming. That's a good point. So if, if you're in the morning and it's, it's dark and you hear one gobble on the limb and it's still dark, how close do you like to get to a bird still in the tree before you set up? I'm always afraid I'll bump them, so I don't know. I mean, it, 100 yards, maybe rule of thumb, but okay. it just depends on the landscape too, if it's hilly or flat or, you know, what, if there's traffic around, you know, and there used to be vehicles, I mean. Now, what about a bird already on the ground gobbling? Like it's midday and you hear one gobbling, how close do you like to get before you set up? Uh, I mean, it, it depends on that cover. If it's early season and leaves aren't really out yet, then you gotta be real careful. Yeah. Uh, try to use terrain to your advantage whenever you can, mm -hmm. but it's I, maybe I don't a couple know. hundred yards at that point in time. Once you're on the yeah, ground, yeah, yeah, because yeah, if he can hear you, then it's just whether or not you can pull him away from whatever hens he's got. 
eventually you, you might be able to. Yeah. So, yeah. what's what's the furthest you've ever seen a bird call to uh, come to a call, and finish out all the way to the where you uh, want? Me personally, it's two hundred or so. Yeah. Yeah. Place in Fayette County, a hundred one time. Yeah. But that's, some that's, people talk about them coming up farther, so yeah. you know. It, it can happen, but they, they, they're not necessarily going to gobble the whole way. They may be, I, I, I like to know the number of people that have called and worked a bird until they thought that bird had gone and the bird wasn't responding anymore and they picked up to move and they see the bird take off. Yep. Man, they will, they will at some point in time, a lot of times they'll go quiet on you and they're not going to necessarily gobble on a string right to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, when in doubt, you think that bird could be potentially around, give it a little time because uh, I've seen that happen myself several times. Yeah. yeah. Unfo unfortunately, it's frustrating when you, th you think you got a bird committed and then they go quiet and you give it another 30, 40 minutes and you think, well, okay, that bird's not coming and then you see the bird. Yep. It can happen. Uh, next question from Andrew. How long does mating season for turkeys usually last? If you've been outside in the last month, then you've seen breeding behaviors, mm -hmm. but probably not breeding yet. Mm -hmm. um, although it's possible, most hens are not, not receptive yet. Mm -hmm. Actual breeding is probably going to happen in April, mm -hmm. uh, April and May. But, you know, places that don't hunt turkeys, unhunted populations, I mean, they're potentially breeding, certainly gobbling, well into June. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, the actual main part of the breeding, though, is going to happen in, in April. It's kind of like the rut's the same deal. I mean, the rut yeah. is a long period of time. There's a peak mm -hmm. rut, but then yeah. there's a secondary rut. And right. So it's, it's kind of the same for turkeys. Because you talk about re-nesting. So a turkey that loses a nest can re-nest re again. Now, mm -hmm. that requires a, a, a secondary breeding, or can they re-nest without a secondary breeding? They can do it without yeah, the yeah. breeding. Yep. Okay. They've got st sperm stored. Okay. They can do it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Ty. He said he's getting uh, his degree in wildlife conservation and would like to find a career in the field. Any advice from the panel on how to get into this field? Uh, I'll say, uh, you know, if you have uh, a niche that you like, uh, you know, if it's turkeys, uh, we have. Uh, turkey biologist, uh, Zach, or small game people, or private lands management stuff, uh, call them up, talk to them, see how you can get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, over the past three, four years, the agency's hired more people uh, than in the past uh, 15 years I've worked with the agency as far as uh, biologists go. So, uh, you know, if you're on a career path for that, I'd say reach out to uh, the agency. Uh, talk and get talk to the biologist that you may be interested in uh, and get involved yeah. uh, the the more you're involved the the better uh, better off you are as far as preparing yourself so getting some real live field experience even though it might be a temporary position man that uh, that's really good when you when you can get some real hands-on experience with the technician out in the field and we yeah. have we we have interns for certain bi biology fields right that they can get involved yeah at least volunteer opportunities as far as interns uh, not so much but okay. there, there's a lot of opportunities uh, from prescribed fire to pulling CWD samples to uh, 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 you know uh, doing certain kind of bird counts that yeah. kind of stuff okay. so there's all kinds of opportunities to get involved yeah. and, and, and learn yeah to just yeah. get involved in some form or fashion and reach out to the department and ask that question I'm sure that you know you, you don't have to just catch these these panel of people, there's a lot of people who work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. You can always reach mm -hmm. out on our, our call info line and uh, and ask to talk to a biologist and uh, leave them a voicemail if they're out in the field and I'm sure they'll get back with you and they'll help you out. Next question is from Terry Cox. Uh, what is the range a tom turkey will travel during the season? Now, you've been doing some studies on this as well, right? Uh, with some of this banding, you know exactly the location where they're banded and you know mm -hmm. the location that the bird was harvested, that's not the maximum range, but we know what the range can potentially be. Mm -hmm. what, what is a Tom's range? We've had some banded birds uh, harvested up to eight miles away. Okay. That's rare though. Most of them are within a mile. Yeah. So typically the same general area that they were banded in, but uh, a few years ago we had a bird 
uh, move, I think it was uh, about seven miles down the river uh, from where it was banded on opening day. We banded it as a jake and it's a two year old bird and it makes a movement a couple weeks before season. On opening day, it's shot seven miles down river. So wow. pretty neat, but it's not that common. Usually they're in a little smaller, smaller area. So we, we had a couple questions earlier about uh, about youth season, and we had uh, questions about blinds, hunting from a blind. When you take your your uh, youth out this year, you gonna be hunting from a blind? Probably some of both. Uh, I don't like being confined to a blind. They're great tools, but mm -hmm. uh, usually I'm too indecisive in the moment, and that's like what I'm what I'm hearing, what I'm feeling, and I like to be able to move. Yeah. Plus, I like to try to keep. I like being the added challenge of being exposed and having to be still and woodsmanship something that I think we should try to pass on to, mm -hmm. to youth, the new hunters, you know, cause there's, you've got to be still, whether that's turkey hunting or deer hunting. So mm -hmm. it, it takes practice to get still, yeah. especially when the pressure's on and there's a bird right there. So, <laughs> what about you? You think you're going to plan on using a blind? You know, I think I always start off using a blind, but uh, then I always yeah. get out of it. And I think go it's always a good something. idea to have yeah, a blind. Yeah, out there. no, it is, especially yeah. for youth. I mean, they give them the idea of you know, uh, of the, the excitement that they're going to feel when that turkey comes in, and yeah. you know, to be able to move and get around, and uh, it's an added challenge to take somebody else and and get them on a bird. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's definitely. And I'll tell you helpful. what, a blind is really good. You you get all of a sudden that little pop-up shower and you get a downpour. If you got a place to jump in there real quick and so, stay somewhat dry, it makes for a little more, uh, a little more pleasant experience than being yeah. soaking wet. So I like to have a blind out there. I don't like being confined to a blind either, but for me, it all really depends on how good is this youth hunter? Can they be still? Because it's, you almost have to bust a bird to experience how still you really have to be. Because you think that when you're deer hunting, you have to be still. Turkey hunting's a different ball game, isn't it? Far it as, is. As yeah. far as being still. You're on the ground level with them, and early in the season, not a whole lot of cover. They, um, they're they pretty slick. They got great eyesight, don't they? Sure. Yeah. Just be nice to be prepared. Depends on what your property you're hunting yeah. like, how much flexibility you have, different spots you have. You may be relegated to a blind, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, here we go. Uh, Nathan wants to know, can you explain how reaping works? Now, reaping um, is a technique of luring, luring a bird. Tell me a little bit about this technique, reaping. Yep, so it's, you're using a fan and put it in front of your body and you're, you're trying to essentially convince that bird that there's another bird, you're it and sometimes that can really elicit aggressive behavior and they can come right to you on a string. Yeah. And it can be very effective. It can also not be sometimes. It can also be very dangerous. Yeah. Um, it's not something your traditional turkey hunters, guys that would have started hunting 25, 30 plus years ago, that wasn't even a technique. And a lot of, a lot of your purest traditional guys kind of don't even consider it. Uh, mm -hmm. They would prefer to call to the animal and bring it in. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's it's a little truer to the biology because they are aggressive. Males are aggressive, but again, you've got to be very careful. Be, uh, if you're going to do this on a WMA, man, I, I just one I absolutely don't recommend it. You need to know where every hunter is out there, and you need yeah. to make sure that you're in a situation where you're. Plus, the bird can come in to you so close that you may not be able to get a safe ethical shot at it. It may be too close and you can easily miss or <laughs> wound a thing. And so you've got to be, you gotta, gotta be prepared for it. It can work real well and it can, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't. It seems to me like, uh, you know, everybody's got very high quality cameras on them right now. And reaping seems like it's a technique that everybody's like, I wanna try to get a bird real close on camera. And it's becoming kind of popular because it's a, it is a up close, personal experience that you can get a bird mm -hmm. right on top of you, but you might scare them away to the other hillside too, because they have to, you have to convince a, an animal that's got excellent sight with this tail, fa this tail fan mm -hmm. that you're a turkey, <laughs> right? <laughs> which is, uh, it, it can mm -hmm. go good or bad. So it can, it you can. gotta be cautious with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're going to WMA, I do not recommend trying that out because if you're good enough to fool another turkey, you might be, good enough to fool another hunter. And that would be the absolute ultimate worst case scenario, right? It would, yep. 
Well, guys, I've learned a lot about turkeys uh, today, and I appreciate you guys coming in. Um, if you have a piece of property that, uh, that you're out there that you, you want to have a biologist look at to help with any of your wildlife needs, please reach out to Jacob and yeah, his please. crew, and they'd be glad to come out there. And it starts off with a form, right? They're going to fill out a form, and you're yeah. going to kind of figure out what they're trying to do with their property, what tools yeah. they have, and uh, put a plan together. It's not a... It's, it, if you're trying to do it for this year, you're probably late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, for the, for, yeah. for the future, that's a great way to go about yeah. it. And uh, if you kill a if you kill a banded bird, we want to know about it. If yep. you uh, if you see a sick bird, which we've not been getting many reports of sick birds, right? Adult birds. We get a handful every year. A handful, so it's not like something we know. expect a lot. But if you get that's it, right. we definitely want to know about for it. For sure. Right? For sure. So mm -hmm. all right, and keep those plugs in the shotguns, right? That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, it's been fun. Hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed. Uh, this turkey question and answer show. Uh, and you know, turkey season's right around the corner. Make sure you get out and get your license. It's always a good idea to pattern that shotgun. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.